Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. Today we are talking about Babel or the Necessity of Violence, an arcane history of the Oxford Translator's Revolution. And yes, that is a mouthful, so I will be referring to this as Babel or Babel in Arcane History, because that's the shortened version you see on the cover of most of the books. And quite frankly, if I have to say this over and over again, I'm going to make mistakes. <laughs> Anyway, this is a recently released historical fantasy by R.F. Kuang. And yes, this is a book. I'm finally back to book reviews after the book eaters. So, you know. R.F. Kuang, the writer of the book, also wrote the Poppy War trilogy, which means she seems to have a thing for the Opium Wars and a critique of imperialism, which, you know, fair. European imperialism was definitely a mood. So, yeah. Definitely seems to have a tone and an interesting magic system development. I hear she had, like, a whole thing for, like, channeling gods in the Poppy Wars, which I... You know what? Having read this, I definitely want to check out the Poppy Wars. Like, seriously, I've, I've been, like, flip-flopping on whether I should do it, but she's definitely sold me on her work. Anyway, as this is historical fantasy, let's get into the summary. Set around the 1820s uh, to 30s, Robin Swift, orphaned by a color outbreak in Canton, China, is brought to London by the mysterious Professor Lovell. In exchange for the professor's generosity... Robin's expected to study at Oxford's Institute of Translation, also known as Babel. Yes, this is an allusion to the Tower of Babel. The university is the center of silverworking, the magical art of manifesting meaning lost in translation through silver bars. However, an encounter with a strange boy named Griffin threatens to expose the darker nature of Babel's work. As the lies and work progresses, Robin is torn between Babel and the Hermes Society, a secret organization struggling with Babel over the future of Brit the British Empire. And that's basically the book. All in all, it's a very interesting tale with some very fascinating uh, core magic system that I really would have liked to see explored a bit more. But quite frankly, what I did see was fantastic. The characters are deep and engaging, although with a lot more complexity than I was actually expecting from this kind of story. One of the things I liked is that Robin doesn't immediately side with either Babel or the uh, revolutionaries. Because, you know, the average person doesn't generally want to get involved in that stuff. And he's portrayed very realistically as a person who just wants to live a happy life in the end. Moving on, I guess it's as good a segue as ever. Let's move on to the characters. First up, we obviously have Robin Swift. He's a very interesting character. Very soft-spoken for the most part. Until the... Well, I'm not going to spoil it. But let's just say he goes through a lot of shit in this, this uh, book. Uh, especially near the end there, jeez. Anyway, Robin was raised in Canton with his family. His family had once been like nobles, but they lost a lot of their wealth when his uncle got addicted to opium and spent their family fortune. However, he had always had a strange caretaker that worked lived with the family. She was English and had him raised to speak English and you know, Mandarin from a young age. And it was quickly revealed the reason why is because Professor Lovell had a deal with his mother to bring him to London to study in the offer of translations. Anyhow, that brings us to Professor Lovell. He is a secondary character slash antagonist through much of the series. Basically, he's... All right, look, this is a minor spoiler, but it comes out in, like, the first three chapters as really obvious. And part of the story is that everyone kind of knows, but no one wants to talk about it until things get real in the later half. So, Professor Lovell is actually Robin's father. Now, they don't admit this. In fact, the reason I'm telling you this right now is because Robin runs with a bunch of his old friends, and they get a look at him, and they're like, My God, Lovell, this one looks even more like you than the last one. It's like, look at the eyes. And, and you know, immediately Robin is sent up to his room, and he's like, Oh, God, he's my father. Now, you might expect him to, you know, confront Lovell, but... He just got brought from a different country into a strange world and told that as long as he listens to Professor Lovell and, you know, as his ward and goes to Oxford, he is to live a comfortable life. And Robin is kind of terrified and scared and alone and decides not to try and fuck up the only good thing by involving potentially unsettling personal relationships. If Lovell wanted to be a father, he would probably have just said that Robin was his son. The fact that he's going to such great lengths to conceal it means Robin is not willing to shake the boat on his only potential source of food and housing. Which, you know, very pragmatic. I mean, he did nearly die of cholera and watched his mother die in front of him, so a bit pragmatism is to be expected, I guess. So yeah, Lovell's kind of an asshole, but he does seem to, on some level, care about Robin. However, this is like, 
Imperial English, and Robin is half, you know, Cantonese. So, it's marred with a lot of English racism. Like, when he accidentally forgets to go to one of his lessons, he's beaten and then told not to be lazy like the rest of his kind. Lovell's words, not mine. Though that does bring me into the other characters. Like I said, we have Rami. Basically, he, like Robin, is the pa is basically the patron of another Englishman who works at Oxford. We don't really run into him that much. I think we only run into him, like, one time. He, you know, knows Sanskrit, and so he's been, obviously, conscripted to work there with the re potential reward of basically getting, like, a full life's run. Basically, you work for Oxford, you make the special silver magic work, and you get to live a comfortable life far better than the rest of your peers as a result. In addition, we have Victoire. She was basically a French... Well, she wasn't a slave because they had outlawed slavery, but it's complicated. I'm not going to go over her entire backstory, just like I'm not going over Rami's whole backstory. Essentially, she had a patron and he died, and the family essentially treated her like a slave, as in she was technically a free person, but she had nowhere else to go, and they used her like a servant. But she managed to get a letter to Oxford that from the professor after she found out that he had been talking about her to his friends and wanting to recommend her to the Oxford Society, so they offered her a position. Then we have Letty. Her whole thing is that her brother was going to Oxford, he didn't like it, and then he died in a tragic accident while drunk one night. And she had always been like more suited for work in the Translation Institute or at Oxford in general. And her father thought having a daughter go to Oxford and take a place from another boy was shameful, but not having a child at all. And this is Letty's words. He said, sending a girl to Oxford is shameful, but not having a child at all is even more shameful. So she was essentially, her going here, her achieving her dream was the lesser of two evils by her father, who essentially also disowned her in the process. Like, she was there solely for family representation, and if she didn't make it here, she was out on her own. So every single one of them have to make this work because the other option is being thrown out homeless on the streets in a strange country that they might have been raised in, but they were raised as academics in isolation. So while there's a lot of comfort involved, they all sort of have this invisible sword of Damocles hanging over their heads. Antony is one of the other, basically he's like the sort of post-grad that they run into on the regular. He's very friendly, does the orientation. There's The reason I'm mentioning it is going to be talking about him in the spoiler section. But you can think of him as a generally friendly guy. He's kind of cool. And he is the foil to Griffin. Now, this is kind of funny because I have a brother named Griffin. But the reason Professor Lovell's friend said it looks just like your other one is because it wasn't. Now, in the summary, and again, minor spoiler, but you learn all this in like the first four or five chapters. Griffin is Lovell's first attempt. See, unlike Robin, he didn't grab... Griffin when he was like 10 or whatever. He grabbed Griffin when he was like 4. However, this resulted in him being raised English and not having practiced enough of his native tongue and he lost the ability to speak it without thought completely fluently like a native. He's still very fluent in it but as a result the magic doesn't work as cleanly for him. Oftentimes bars will only work sometimes if that makes sense. He's been making strides to try and get it back over time, but once you lose it, it's much harder to get it back. So as a result, Lovell viewed him as a failure, and eventually he was recruited by the Hermes Society. They're sort of like the rebellion against the British Empire. It's a long story, I'll get to it later on. Moving on there, we have the themes. Obviously, there's the inherent cruelty of imperialism, the necessity of violent protest, versus an attempt to change a corrupt system from within, and the way people can support cruelty without being necessarily cruel themselves. Not naming any names, because that would be spoilers. The main mimicry of this, though, and one of the refrains, is that translation is always an act of betrayal. And it's weird how well they m manipulate that into the plot. So, for this, we have to move into sort of some talk. But essentially, they're acting as translators for their native tongues. Because she actually knows uh, Creole, and she's being used to translate text they don't have in order to gain more words for the magic system. And they are essentially translating their native tongues for Britain to use their native tongues to fuel their magic to further oppress their nations. 
Which is a, just a fascinating twist on the quote of translation is always an act of betrayal. Because what it means is that you can never truly translate something one from one from one language to another. There's always some meaning lost in a translation, no matter how faithful. Which leads us into the magic system. And OMG, have I just been waiting to talk about this all month. So, silver working. This is a fascinating idea, and I have rarely seen somebody come up with such an interesting, unique twist on a magic system. Basically, the way it works is it's heavily inspired by the idea that all languages were shattered at the Tower of Babel. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Tower of Babel is a Judeo-Christian myth in the Bible. I think it's in Genesis, I want to say. And it involves the idea that there was once a universal human language, and the people of ancient times tried to build a tower to ascend to heaven. However, God got, you know, up, uppity mortals getting in the way, so he blasted the tower and in the process fragmented all human languages in an attempt to forever divide us so that we could never attempt to rise to heaven again. And the idea is that in this world, whenever you translate something, the, there is meaning that is lost. So if you were to translate, um, let's say there was a word in Chinese that means vapor, but it comes connotation of like energy and stuff like that into steam. What you get is a, you leave behind the meaning of power and energy and heat. And so if you engrave the two words onto the front and back of a silver bar, you can literally harness that meaning and enforce it upon reality. So basically you take a, two words that are etymologically connected, but divided by language and the languages have to be spoken by and regularly appreciated by a sizable chunk of humanity. They even explained early on, they tried creating fictional languages. They tried using old English, but that's a dead language. Latin only works because the Bible's still a thing. Um, and basically all of it goes to show the rules. You know, it's very hard to find these match pairs. You can link them together and mix and match them. It's all this crazy nonsense. But you can create so many weird effects. Like there are bars to uh, expel violent force or power or pull cars or increase machinery work. And there are all these fascinating uses that I could go over but honestly, you should just read it for yourself. It is a trip. And every time a new bar comes up, I'm like, ooh, how does this one work? What's the twist here? And it's just fascinating. It's interesting. And it shows how the act of translation truly is a betrayal. They are literally stripping the excess meaning off their own languages in order to fuel the silver bars of the uh of Babel and of the British Empire it is really interesting and really fascinating the, the ways in which they've used it um and quite frankly I don't know enough about other languages and languages in general to fully appreciate this system moving on from that I have to give credit to Kuang for her diligent research apparently she actually I actually looked her up a bit she attended Oxford and Cambridge and she's done extensive research onto Victorian era, London, and Oxford, as well as obviously China. She seems to have a knack for that in general. Moving on to the writing, this is a very dark academia kind of writing. It can be very dry and academic at times. And if you don't like having lots of things explained to you, because there's a lot to keep up with in this world, I'm not sure you're going to like it. In addition, there are a few other issues I did have with this book. Um, but I will get on to that in just a moment. As for writing in general, though, I do think Kuang has this knack for really immersing you in this world. But I do have to make it very clear, this is a slow burn of a book. It's over 500 pages long, and I'd say the plot doesn't really get started until, like, 60% of the book. If you can make it to 60% of the book, it is a fantastic plot with a payoff. I just, mmm, mm, that final chapter, mwah, mwah. Oh, perfection. I mean, I saw what they were going to do coming, and all I could do is watch a tragedy as it all played out. And given by Griffin's fate, that's kind of the point. Jeez. So, yes, this is a slow burn, but you will like it if you stick it out. In addition, 
I do have one of my rarer complaints. See, I don't think I've talked about this since my Uprooted video. Because generally, audiobooks are just an efficient way for me to get this book. Now, I had to reread this book. And it's not because the audiobook is atrocious, but it's definitely lacking quality. Audible, you need to step your game up here. So, the audiobook has these interruptions by the author in a very, like, imperial tone. Like, going like, and this is what happened in this time period. You know, saying the scenes and stuff like that. And there are a few moments like that, and I'm fine with that. It's a thing a lot of books do, like weird quotes to the star. Book eaters did stuff like it, too. But the main problem I have is that, especially in the beginning, this is less of a problem the longer the audiobook goes on, but throughout the audiobook, every once in a while, the author will be talking, and all of a sudden, the audio will, like, abruptly cut. And then the same voice starts talking, but it's like this worse quality version. Like, it's almost like this slightly scratchier, slightly off. You know that weird sound when you can tell somebody had to get a new mic halfway through, like, the editing or recording? And, like, it's not like the audio quality is necessarily entirely worse, but it's edited differently, and you can tell, like, the weird pitches and stuff like that. I can't really explain it better than that if you don't know what I'm talking about, but it is really weird. In conclusion, Babel and Arcane History and Oxford Translator's Revolution is... Oh gosh, this book is fantastic. This is one of the best books I've read this year. When Women Were Dragons and this book are going to have a fight to the death for top place. And quite frankly, I just... I'm astounded. I knew this was going to be good. It sounded good. I've been looking forward to this since I ran into it while searching for new books at the beginning of this year. I have been excited for this book. And I haven't even read any of this author's other stuff. I'm excited to read more of her stuff. I love finding a new author like this. Yes, are there minor problems? Sure. But when I review a work, I tend to review it based on its best outcome. Because I think once you know where the best source to get is, you know, like with Dionysi, I said, I'm going to judge this based on a $25, you know, payment because that's what you can get on Steam. I'm also going to judge this based on its physical book and not its audiobook. But that's with the understanding that the audiobook does have a few audio quality problems and you should probably should get the physical book and read it. It also has a lot of pictures and diagrams, which I just, I love it when authors do stuff like this. Naomi Novik does this too in her Scholomance series. Ma, ma, ma. Authors, give me schematics of the buildings. I need it. I need to visualize more thoroughly. Beautiful artwork. Love it. Anyway, with all that said and done, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. It has a few bumps, but I was just so enthralled by the story at the end. I don't care. It's fantastic. It's really good writing. Interesting magic systems. Complex, morally nuanced characters. Holy shit, what Letty did is unforgivable, and yet I can't stop wondering if somehow they could have made it work. And it's one of this, like, slow-rolling tragedy where you learn up front that everything is gonna go to fucking hell, and you can't help but just watch as it all comes crumbling down. Oh, fantastic. Alright, with that out of the way, we're going to go to the spoiler section. If you don't want to hear any spoilers and you just want to skip to the announcements and the outro, there should be a timestamp on screen. I've been doing that lately. Should still be there. Anyway, everybody good? Okay, spoiler time. So, I already talked to you about the beginning. Let's get into the Hermes Society. The Hermes Society is basically made up of people who ran away from Babel once they realized what it was. Griffin is uh, Robin's brother. And they find each other on a weird night while Robin helps a few of them escape without entirely realizing what he was doing. Robin ends up opening the door for a few people to let them into Babel and pass the wards, but that's all he does. And he kind of finds a weird balance between his life at, at Babel and with the Hermes Society. It's really interesting the way he doesn't really fully commit, and Griffin understands that. Robin is happy living his life, and he thinks this can just keep getting you on. He feels good about helping the Hermes Society, what he sees is kind of a morally right thing to do, and he just lets them in. They steal a few books or grab a few tools that, honestly, Babel has so many, Griffin even makes a point that most of the professors won't even notice they're missing. And they don't. People don't even realize it. He goes stealing, he lets people in to steal stuff for months and nobody realizes it. However, Griffin starts getting cagier and cagier, and even after all this time, he's not exactly being considerate about Griffin's questions. 
And it gets worse. Because one day, Griffin comes in and sees that somebody's been shot in front of the Tower of Babel. And he's worried because the new wards seem like they're dangerous. So he tries to warn Griffin, obviously. And Griffin doesn't listen. It ends with Robin being shot, everyone else dead, and him nearly being caught. Afterwards, he calls Griffin out on being a, you know, self-centered asshole. But Griffin's already bolted, and he doesn't see him for a full year. When he comes back, Griffin is cagey, you know, tattered, looks like he's been living on the streets. What the hell's going on, Griffin? You abandoned me. I got shot. I nearly got caught. I swear I was this close. If professor, if one of the other professors had been, had been a little more observant, I'd probably be in jail right now. What is wrong with you? And he's like, oh, no, sorry, but uh, I've been doing other business. I have other stuff to do aside from you. Which, you know, obviously makes Robin feel a little used. And then Griffin asks him to plant a bomb. And there's this beautiful moment, because Robin... And the Hermes Society and Griffin, they'd all been trained in a much more realistic right light. Like, Robin's a new recruit. They're not going to tell him shit until he's proven himself. And Griffin asks something big. Robin might have helped them steal some stuff, but that's all non-violent. What Griffin's asking, Griffin says, just plant it somewhere without people and let it go off. It's like, what if it hurts someone? It's like, look, just plant it. And it's a step too far, you know? It's from this shady organization. Robin doesn't know what they do with any of the stuff they give. And he has no proof they're actually sending it back to the other countries to help. And he rightfully calls Griffin out on, like, hey, do you really think I'm just a gullible idiot who'll do anything you say with no answers? And he gives him this non-answer about an upcoming conflict in Vietnam, and Griffin's like, no, no, I just need an answer. I need you to show me an actual reason why I should support this group here and now. And Griffin can't give it to him, and Robin says, you know what, I'm out. And Griffin actually accepts it. He says, fine, you're out. I will never contact you again. And he doesn't. For like a year, Griffin does not have to deal with... Griffin and Robin don't see each other again. Robin is nearing his third year. They went to this big old dance with his friends, Remy, uh, Victoire, and Letty. They formed this close friendship. He feels like, you know what, I... I'm not sure if it was right or not, but I knew... Uh, he believes that what he was trying to do was a step too far. And he has his friends to think about. He has... Professor Lovell, to an extent, who's actually been a bit proud of him in recent years. And you know what? He feels like he did the right thing. And then he finds out... So during finals week, uh, for their third year, I want to say, is either second or third year, he sees... He's, like, sleep-deprived to the point where he's, like, mildly hallucinating, and he thinks he sees Antony on the streets. The problem is, Antony, their guide, had died on a sea voyage... And, Ro and Griffin had not seemed to be too upset about it. Turns out that's how the Hermes Society members faked their debts. And Antony was one of their operatives. And he had recruited Victoire and Rami. Without Griffin's knowledge and without Robin knowing about it. So they all thought they were keeping secrets. Now, this happened only a few months before an incident. They weren't around as long as, Gri as uh, Robin. So, they get caught. Now, Robin sees them going to sneak in, realizes what's going on, realizes that somebody recruited them. He hears from them, Antony, he frees them, but he ends up getting caught in the trap instead. He tells them to run, and Professor Lovell finds him and drags him away. It's revealed that Professor Lovell had been suspecting him since the other professor saw that he was injured after the break-in with the bullets. Uh, he had the, he said, the other, you're lucky the other professor is really dumb. However, I said nothing because I had hoped you'd learned your lesson, and I'd been hoping you might lead us to more of the Hermes Society. I don't blame you, Robin. It's in your upbringing. His words, not mine. And he goes on this big old speech about the Hermes Society. They're just anarchists. They're violent terrorists. Uh, he does have a point about Griffin. Griffin is severely mentally unhinged to an extent. And he basically just asks Robin to tell him everything he knows. And Robin's like, look, I don't know anything. Griffin only contacted me. I was only able to send a message to him by carving on this tree. He said he would never be there again. He told me off. And uh, they're very decentralized. I don't even know where Griffin is. It's like, I only know about, like, one safe house Griffin occasionally goes to. Uh, and I don't even think he actually goes there. I think he just told me in. It's like, oh, well, this is something. Thank you for cooperating. And you know what? He lets him go back. However... It's very clear that it's because Robin is too valuable to lose. See, because the Qing have made teaching Cantonese, Mandarin, or any form of Chinese too 
any foreigners pun- punishable by death. There are very, very few uh, Chinese language scholars at Babel, which means very few people who can activate the Chinese match pair. See, the magic works by engraving the uh, stuff on the bar, and then you have to speak the word and then the other word uh, and activates the translation. However, the magic will only activate if you're proficient, as in like fully mentally natively proficient in both languages. It's the kind of thing scholars have to practice at for decades, but people who are born into bilingual families obtain this naturally with almost no work aside from basic, you know, constantly speaking the language to maintain it. And it's revealed early on, and you don't entirely figure this out until later, Robin is now one of the only three Chinese speakers in the entire organization. Professor Lovell, one other professor, and Robin. That makes him very, very valuable. I.e., he's one of only three people who can activate the match pairs. Um, and so, they can't really afford to lose him. So, it's hard to tell if Lovell does care about him and want to see his son succeed and believe he really was just influenced. Or, he's just trying to preserve the only Chinese speaker they have. Like, what do you do? Is he telling the truth? What's the deal? And I'd say, having watched the whole series, there was probably a part of Lovell that felt proud of Robin. Like, it's very clear Griffin was his failed experiment, but Robin was, like, his success. He looked at Robin like a template of how they could get other Chinese speakers, you know. Have children there, let them be raised there for a while, bring them over to London, raise them as proper Englishmen, and then let them work for Babel. And Robin's success in the last few years, especially his passing of the tests that allow you to work with translations in the silverworking uh, part of the building where you have to pass a test, where you have to come up with the match pair and make it work in front of a test, otherwise you can't ever work there. It's just, there's this certain level of pride he takes. Not necessarily in him as a son, but more of him as a, a successful project. And I won't say there wasn't some kind of fucked up love there, because maybe, but also, Professor Lovell is kind of an asshole, and at the same time, we have got to see his kids. It's complicated. Anyway... This all basically goes swimmingly. Uh, They end up going on their trip to Canton, where Robin's going to act as a translator and the others are going to get, you know, travel experience. However, the experience changes him. He sees how berating and demeaning a lot of the English speakers are to the Chinese. uh, How they call them savages and backwards. Um, And he actually speaks with the representatives there and watches as his own people, you know, the people from London, from England, are insulting them like actively insulting like they're telling them things they would not say to other people in england there's even this moment where the representative through his translator asks you this this uh opium is illegal in your country so why would you expect us to allow you to freely trade it here and the guy just goes blubbering about free trade and how our laws aren't yours and you don't have the right to restrict that here we have the right to the and Robin just kind of doesn't even translate that part. He just stares at the guy. And it's like, holy shit, dude. Uh, it's like, yeah, he has a point. And Robin meets with the tra- the uh, representative because he has to speak with Robin alone. And he's like, "Will the- are they willing to negotiate or are they here in bad faith? And Robin's like, they are not here. We will not, they will not ba- uh, bow to any demands. And he's like, I see. A translator is a noble profession. I wish you nothing but the best. And he leaves. He seems, like, mildly respectful of Robin for putting up with their shit (laughs) throughout the whole meeting. And then they actually do play out an event from history where they burn all the opium on the beach. And all all of them leave, and Lovell is infuriated. And he... Well, he beat, he beat Robin before. Robin is still very scared of him because Robin was definitely abusive. Like I said, he might have loved him in some fucked up way, but abusive parenting was definitely in fashion back in the day. Not excusing it at all. It's really fucked up. Um, and Lovell doesn't actually hit him, but he keeps getting scared. And he starts shouting and screaming, and he reaches into his coat, and we don't really know what. Maybe he was going to grab a gun. We don't know, but Robin is scared and alone, and he thinks Lovell's going to kill him for the diplomatic incident. And so he throws this bar that Lovell had given to him. Apparently Griffin used it to kill another student, but there's a lot more backstory there we'll get into in a second. 
And it was this bar that took all of the pain and suffering out of these words and inflicted it through the translation. And it basically just, like, blasts level open. Now, they try and hide the body and throw him overseas. overseas. They managed to conceal it for quite a while, but after, like, a week of being back, everyone's on to them. And during a gala for, like, the next year starting up, one of the professors tries to talk to Robin and say, Look, I know about Professor Lovell. I work for the Hermes Society, yes. Can you tell me what... Oh, yeah. And then Griffin's, and then Robin's like, yes, uh, Griffin's planning the thing, you know. Of course, the thing. And where are you meeting him? And it's very clear it's a trap. They all know. So Robin uh, and Le Levy is on board with, like, the whole hiding the murder. Because, look, Levy wasn't on board with the uh, terrorist group, that, as we'll get to later. We'll see about that. I'll tell you about that later. But she was on board with hiding the murder of Professor Lovell. Because, first off... She thought it was disgraceful that Professor Lovell had not, uh, you know, actively admitted that Robin was his son because having illegitimate offspring and then having them around you all the time and not admitting it is kind of, you know, a little shameful. She thought he was being disgraceful and, and generally cruel to Robin. She had seen the way Robin reacted around him sometimes that showed an abusive household. And she was actually cool with hiding a murder. Now, she was freaking out, but she was willing to do it for her friends. However, this is the moment that splits them apart when they reveal about the Hermes Society. See, they find Lovell's notes that implied that he was trying to start a war. So that the, it basically, we're seeing the, the diplomatic incident started by the British so that they can instigate the Opium Wars, okay? And they can't handle this. So they decide to bring the papers to the Hermes Society. And for a time, Levy's going on with it, but Griffin, of course, has to kind of ruin everything. See, Antony and Griffin were part of the same class, and they were with two other students, one of whom was, like, a proper Oxford son, and the other was, like, his sister, uh, who Griffin tried to seduce into joining the Hermes Society. However, she was apparently playing the long con with him and trying to get him into a trap. And when he went to go steal supplies one night with her, she revealed that the building was going to be surrounded in a matter of minutes, and she essentially mocked him and told him how she had played him for all these years, played upon his affection and love, uh, in his words, she was very cruel. Others said she was a saint and could never harm anyone like that. Griffin is mentally unstable to a ridiculous degree, so he's definitely exaggerating some of it. We don't know how much. Bare minimum, though, she was definitely saying some stuff that was cruel enough to get, um, Griffin angry. And just like Robin, in desperation to escape, he threw the bar at her and killed her. And her whole death has been this, like, tragic mystery up until this point. Uh, until Lovell tells Griffin about when he hands him the bar is like a representation of why you shouldn't stray, which he inevitably kills Lovell with. Because a tool for murder is inevitably used to kill other people. Duh. Anyway, Robin and the others flee and join the Hermes Society in an underground secret library. There they meet Antony. And Antony and Griffin are sort of the two... Think of them like a Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X situation. Griffin believes that violent, violent revolution is the only answer, that the system cannot be changed from within. And to a certain extent, he's right that violence is needed to shock the system. However, Antony believes that even if uh, some mild acts of disruption are necessary, like blowing up docks when nobody's around or stuff like that, acts of murder are a step too far, and the system can be reformed. He, they, the Hermes Society has allies with the more uh, progressive side of the... House of Lords, and they've been trying to plan a vote uh, and a propaganda campaign to disrupt the vote, and they're nearly on to the final stage when they're about to leave. However, Levy has been overhearing how Griffin's been, like, blowing up docks and destroying stuff, and she turns on them. She decides that she cannot support what she sees as violent terrorists against her homeland, and she rats them out. Just as they're about to leave to instigate what is essentially going to be a peaceful dispute of the declaration of war against China, Levy brings the cops to them and locks them down before Antony and the others can go instigate their plan for a final push in the party, in the Whigs party, I believe. And in the process, she ends up pointing a gun at her friends. And she shoots and kills Remy. And that changes everything. The other two, Victoire and Robin are captured and they are tortured by the older brother of the sister Griffin murdered. His fellow classmate. They were the essentially the four friends before our current protagonists. 
Levy has betrayed them, shot and killed one of their friends, and it's not entirely clear why she did it. And their torture, like torture, torture. They use silver work in some fucked up ways uh, for this. Handcuffs that just keep amplifying pain, just mental disruption tactics that make you babble on nonsense for days. Your mind is literally ripped apart. It's intense. They even try and tr- even tries to trick Robin into thinking they killed Victoire while tricking Victoire with the same. Basically, they had a time gunshot and they tried to pretend that it was going to be uh, unless they gave information. Griffin ends up freeing them, but in the process, the other student manages to find them, chase them down, and he and Griffin kill each other. Antony was killed earlier on in the raid. The sister died years ago at Griffin's hands, and this is the final end to a bloody revolution fueled by the differences between these four people who deeply cared about each other, but whose very natures and life circumstances tore them apart in a way that could never be fixed. Just like our protagonist. In case you haven't noticed, it's a mirror. Yay. So, moving on from there, Victoire and Griffin and Robin regroup, and they're essentially alone. Griffin was their only source for the rest of the Hermes Society. Antony and the others are dead. Remy is dead. They've lost everything. It's all over. Their plan is in shambles. And so they do the only thing they have left. They know that they have some people still on the inside in Babel. So they move to take the tower. Basically, it's mostly scholars. Once you get past the wards, everything's fine. So they manage to get sneak in by following someone else in because the wards are mostly meant to prevent people from stealing stuff and leaving. But as long as you follow a scholar, as long as the scholar opens the door, like what Robin did, you can still get in. And so they barge in with a gun and take the building. They break the blood vials and essentially lock the door behind them, along with one other uh, professor who had been working with the Hermes Society in a limited capacity, and two, one other, an additional professor who realized the system was unjust, listened to their speeches, along with the three students who sided with them. Everyone else left. And they essentially go on strike. Other workers who had been basically, professed, basically the Industrial Revolution protests, essentially, but for silver working. And they get aid, and they essentially try and wait the government out. It's basically no more silver working, and the silver working will not continue until um, the they decide to vote that they will not invade China. Until they give an official declaration that they will not invade China. And now, this might not seem like a big deal. It's like, oh yeah, but they have all these magic chips and stuff like that. They don't, though. See... This is where Babel's own greed comes back to bite itself. And I see some very, very interesting similarities between DRM, and I've been waiting to talk about this the whole time. So here's my moment. Got like five minutes. Okay, so Babel had designed their silver work to wear out quickly. And it constantly needs to be like retuned, and it has to be uh, paired with these resonance rods and the towers. And there are minor facilities, but everything has to come through Babel. And it's very small, minor work. Like, literally people just saying words on the bars. But they charge exorbitant fees from it. And they make these things last less time, so you have to buy new ones or get them refreshed really often. And the reason they do that is because it makes them boatloads of money. However, that's now coming back to bite them in the ass, because within a few months, the entire city of Oxford is now shutting down like the power goes out within weeks it's that bad the entire city goes down it's essentially what would happen if microsoft apple and amazon said hey we're shutting down all our servers and you guys can't do anything that requires a connection to our servers so you can't register any microsoft accounts you can't sign in you can't get access to your OneDrive. you can't get access to your amazon orders all the orders are just gonna be frozen in place Oh, your iPhone? Sorry, you can't access your cloud pictures, you can't access your email, you can't access any of this stuff. Anything that uses our servers, you can't use. It's all shut down. Imagine if every Microsoft, Amazon, Apple server were to be powered off, and they and the company said as a unit, they would not turn them back on until the world decided to agree to a ceasefire between Russia and the U.S. 
That's basically what's going on here. And it's very effective, actually. Like, the country goes into outrage, but Parliament will not bend. See, they've been giving a lot of silver to China in exchange for porcelain and tea and stuff. And as a result, they have a silver deficiency. They don't have enough to keep running silver working at the rate of expansion they've been doing. The reason they need to invade China is to steal their silver. And they can't, they're not willing to give it up. It gets worse and worse. And for a while, it looks like the strike is going to work, you know? And eventually they even find out there's a bridge. One of the, like, the big bridges in London is about to go down. And when it goes down, it will devastate the city for decades. Like the pollution, the uh, damage to the infrastructure. It would just be such a catastrophic thing. There's no way they will let it go down. So they let them know. And they say, it goes down unless you agree to our terms. And they're trying to be nonviolent about it. They really are. Victoire is essentially the embodiment of Antony's beliefs at this point. She believes you can force a nonviolent revolution. Because they had actually done it. They shot one of the professors, but he lived. They had managed to take the tower without any casualties. They thought they could do this. But Parliament does not relent. The bridge goes down. And that's their only trump card left. Levy comes to offer them a solution. She comes to barter for their lives. She said she begged for their lives. And they're still valuable translators for unique languages. With Professor Lovell dead, um, Robin is one of the only two Cantonese and Mandarin translators they have left. They need him. A lot. And Victoire is one of like only two Creole translators and probably the best one they have. They need them. They're irreplaceable. So Levy offers that if they surrender, if they agree to work for Babel again, they can go free. Uh, one of the other professors was unwilling to deal with the damage the bridge would cause. The others have kind of resigned themselves to so this is what we need to do. He surrendered to the others and he's been tortured for information. And there's this moment afterwards where Robin kind of admits that he didn't expect to survive this. He and Victoire kind of makes his own to go along, but he knew they wouldn't relent. And he led the others on anyway. Because he loved Rami. Rami was the first person he had met that truly seemed to understand him. And yes, they do add like a sort of like a pseudo, I kind of secretly loved you, loved you relationship there. Uh, Tumblr is already on it. You probably see some pictures down below uh, that I grabbed from Tumblr. So, you know, check that out. But, <clears throat> basically, <sighs> Remy, he, d Robin decides to give them their final solution, in which they, res in which they recreate the myth of the Tower of Babel. See, there's a single rule, an oddity of translation. You cannot create a silver work that translates the meaning of translation. If you take two words that both mean translation and try and translate them to get what, basically to try and get the pure essence of translation, it causes the silver bar to explode, destabilize, explode, and all the silver becomes unusable. That silver is now dead and it can no longer be used for silver working. In addition, any silver it touches becomes corrupted, also useless. And the entire building is a giant silver magic conduit for the entire nation's silver supply. The resonance frequencies that they use to transmit power to the smaller uh, things and supply things would allow them to send this wave of destruction across the entire country. Estimates put it at like 70-80% of the silver in the country would be tainted. Britain would... You, England would literally be unable to operate as an empire for decades. They wouldn't be stopped but they'd be delayed. They would give other countries time to catch up. However, it's so destructive. They're, they're destroying the Tower of Babel, and they're in it. They put it to a vote, and Victoire and one other student vote against it. And they leave. They can't be a part of this. Victoire sees that as a betrayal of her dear friend Antony, the one who took her into the Hermes Society, who preached a non-violent solution. Meanwhile, Robin's gone from this naive kid who didn't want to plant an explosive bomb because he saw it as a step too far to someone who's been to who's accidentally, you know, who's watched his homeland be defiled, himself be insulted, his friend murdered, betrayed by his other friend. He's lost his brother to the violence of this cycle of hatred. He killed his adoptive father in a fit of panic or rage or fear. He has nothing left. He wants to die. 
And the final, uh, the other professor who is com realizes the extent to which she's been complicit in all these years, the people she's helped, that she, the things she tried to shove to the back of her mind, along with two of the other students agree to help them set it off. They engrave the, the match pair across as much of the silver as they can, and they run across the building, all four corners, shouting out the words. And there's this really sad moment where they talk about how to most effectively destroy the building to make it unusable. And they realize they can't be together. They all need to be in the four corners of the tower, destroying it in as many places as possible. And there's this horrible moment where they talk about how we won't die together as a team. We will die alone, crushed by rubble. And as Rami's dying, as the silver's going nuclear, he has this final memory of Rami back when they were first around, you know that hopeful days when they thought that they had the world in front of them, that they would become Oxford scholars in, tra in, the, in Babel's Tower, and they'd work silver and translations, and they would spread knowledge and understanding. And he just kind of sits there in the memory before he dies, wishing it was still those happy, innocent days. Victoire watches as the tower goes down with the soul of the survivor, she takes Remy's, Remy, uh, not Remy, but uh, Robin's notes. One of the students had taken out a last testament. Robin had been the only one throughout the whole thing, and he really wanted to know what happened. So they gave one set to the other uh, protesters who had been with them. Victoire took the, uh, the remaining copy. And, I, you know, the implicit understanding is that book became the book we're reading now, essentially, you know? Uh, sort of a meta reason for the book's existence. And that's it. The story ends with Victoire heading out to try and find a new life in a world so thoroughly broken, shattered, and disconnected. And oh my god, that ending was just so good. Like, oh god. I, I love the moment where Robin admits to her he didn't expect to live and he tells her she should go. Because she... Because Robin was this innocent. He really was. He was innocent until he met Griffin. He didn't realize what was going on, the true extent of the cruelty. And even after he saw it, he wasn't willing to be violent. It was only after he lost everything. The, you know, his first friend who he loved more than anything, his brother, his father, his homeland, his light, comfortable life. He, he thought he had lost Victoire. And then he found her and Griffin only to lose Griffin and watch him killed by his b former best friend. And there's just this horrible moment where you can feel when Robin gives up on life. And it's just tragic. The whole book is this rolling tragedy. And it hurts. So, moving on to announcements. Today, we have a few things coming up. I finished my playthrough of Steel Rising. Look forward to that sometime this week. In addition, I'm going to have to have two additional videos this week to try and catch up because I'm a little behind. So I'll also be reviewing that new cyberpunk anime. I know I've been talking about it. In addition, movies. I don't have anything lined up quite yet, actually. I will be getting to that later. But however, after Steel Rising and Cyberpunk, guess what book I'm reviewing? That's right. Two books Back to back in a week? I know. Anyway, it's going to be the Scholomance Book 3, The Golden Enclaves by Naomi Novik. So guess what? My favorite author gets to come back. Well, maybe not my favorite author. She, she's definitely up there. It's like her, Christopher Paolini, and um, Rick Reardon. They're all kind of my favorites. I like them all for different reasons, if that makes sense. So... I can't wait to see it. It's going to be so much fun. So, uh, yeah. With all that out of the way, I will see you guys next time. Hope you enjoyed the video. On your screen, you should be seeing a link to my channel. If you go there and subscribe, that'd be great. In addition, you'll be seeing two other links. One's to my Season 2 playlist. That's all the videos from 2022. In addition, below that, you should be seeing a link to a video that YouTube apparently recommends you click on. So, you know, why not click on it? See one of my other videos. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe it'll have something else you'll enjoy. Uh, maybe YouTube doesn't know shit. We'll find out together.